This is on the ear anatomy. So make sure you have out your ear anatomy parts to know. Lab study slides form. And at the end, I will also go over a couple things uh, extra on the eye and some reflexes. So as we can see on this ear anatomy, there's also three parts just like the eye, but it's areas instead of layers. Remember in the eye, we had three tunics, but in the ear, we have an outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. All right, let's review with a diagram first, these areas. The external or outer ear is going to include the earlobe, the ear canal, called the external auditory meatus, and the eardrum part that's exposed to the outer air. That's also called the tympanic membrane for eardrum. On your real ear, we have the earlobe, also called the auricle or pina. We have the external auditory meatus, air canal. We had that on the skull. And then we have the outer part of the eardrum tympanic membrane there. That's the external or outer ear. Remember on the skull, there's our external auditory meatus, and the earlobe would be right out here. And deep in there would be the eardrum, tympanic membrane. Okay, for the middle ear, we're going to have the inner part of the eardrum, tympanic membrane, Three ossicles, called auditory ossicles, hearing bones. I'll go over them in a minute. This big space in the air that has air in it, that's called the tympanic cavity, or the middle ear cavity. And then we have a tube connecting the middle ear cavity to the throat. That can be called several names. They call it the auditory tube here. But it's also called the eustachian tube, which I like that name the best. If we look on the sheet, we can also see it's called the pharyngotympanic tube because it leads from the tympanic cavity, middle ear cavity, to the pharynx throat. So in the middle ear, one, two, three, four, five, six structures. Let's look at them on the model. There it is. Inner part of the tympanic membrane, eardrum. This middle ear cavity here with the auditory ossicles in it. Let's look at the ossicles. The first one connected to the eardrum, which is the best way to tell it, is the hammer or malleus. It's supposed to look like a hammer or mallet, but the best way to tell is the first one connected to the drum because you beat the drum with a mallet, right? Then we come to the middle bone, shaped like an anvil. This top part would be the anvil. They used to bend metal. Uh, after they heat metal up, they would bend it on the top part of the anvil but you're not always gonna see that triangular shape. So I go by the middle bone, anvil or incus. They both start with a vowel. And then we have the third auditory bone, the stirrup, also called the stapes. And that's, you put your foot in that when you ride a horse and you sit on the saddle and put your foot in the stirrups. We go back at the diagram. There's your malleus or hammer, anvil or incus, both start with a vowel, and then the stirrups or stapes. 
That's the middle ear. Now we get to the inner ear, we're gonna have three main structures. And that's gonna be the cochlea, it looks like a snail, and that's for hearing. The semicircular canals, which are half circles. Semi means half, there's three of them, one going in each direction. And joining the semicircular canals is the vestibule, which means like a hallway. So the vestibule connects the cochlea to the semicircular canals. There's also going to be two windows here. Now you can't really see the oval window, but the oval window is between the stirrup and the vestibule. And sound waves are going to go through the bones through that membrane, the oval window, into the cochlea. And the sound waves are going to go through the cochlea, and any leftover sound waves are going to come out this window here called the round window, because it's round. The oval window is oval because the end of the stirrup is oval. And then we also have in here the nerves. We have a nerve from the semicircular canals, a nerve here from the semicircular canals, there's the vestibular nerve, and we have a cochlear nerve, and they're all going to join to become the vestibular cochlear nerve, also called the auditory nerve. On the model, we can see first cochlea, three semicircular canals, and then joining them is the vestibule. And we can see the vestibular cochlear nerve, auditory nerve there for hearing and balance. As far as the windows go, well, this was the stirrups here, so the oval window would be around that. You can kind of see it right here. You see that oval structure, but it'd be on the between the stirrups and the vestibule. The round window, we don't really see on this model, but it would be right in here, below the oval window. Let's look on this model now that shows just about everything. It's a little bit smaller, but it shows things quite clearly. Coming from the other direction though, external ear, three structures. Earlobe, auricular, vena, Expands the sound waves into the auditory canal called the external auditory meatus. There's your temporal bone. And then the outer part of the tympanic membrane, the eardrum. Now we move to the middle ear. Inner part of the eardrum, tympanic membrane. The three ear ossicles, let's connect that one there. Well, I'll have to pretend like it's connected. Remember, we want to go by where they are. So this, connected to the eardrum, is the hammer. Right it's up to there. Now we look down, we can see the anvil and the stirrups. If we take this out, we can see a little bit better on the anvil. There. Okay, we'll put it back now. Then we have the uh, middle ear cavity here, tympanic cavity, and that leads to the eustachian tube. Ringo tympanic tube, some people call it the auditory tube, it has three names. I like your station too. That's the common name. Then we get to the inner ear. Find the three main parts first. They took the top of the cochlea off. There. You can see how that looks like a snail, the cochlea. From this angle, Cochlea, semicircular canals, and vestibule. I'll put it in the way it's supposed to be. 
because they took the top of the cochlea off so you could see the canals in there, the chambers. Quite detailed. We're not going to get into it here. Vestibule and semicircular canals, and those are the three nerves that join the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canals. Vestibular, cochlear nerve, auditory nerve, when they join, all this in the temporal bone. Our windows are the oval window here. And this time you can see the round window. Yeah, here it is. Right there. Okay. So it's right beneath the oval window. Sound waves in, extra sound waves out. All right, now let's get to the, uh, oh, we have another inner ear and middle ear model here. They didn't show the outer ear. So let's look at that. The middle ear, eardrum, hammer, anvil, stirrups, inner ear, cochlea, semicircular canals, vestibule. We can see really good the nerves coming from the vestibule, semicircular canals, and the cochlea. Trying to see if the round one is there, but I don't see it. But the oval window would be right in here. They took the uh, front of the cochlea off here to show you the winding pathway. Okay, there's gonna be fluids in there. And there's going to be a special microscopic hearing organ in there where you have many of them. And that's going to be called the organ of Corti. Organ of Corti. So I'll show you a microscope picture of that. Here's all the canals in the cochlea. And right in the middle is the organ of Corti. And there it is. And what I point out on this there's lots of names for structures, but what I want you to remember, especially, is that this organ of Corti has hair cells with hairs on them. And the hair cells are connected to nerves. So when the sound waves finally get to this inner ear, they're going to move fluid in the cochlea, and the fluid is going to move the hairs and the hairs are going to stimulate the hair cells to send nerve messages along these nerves to the brain to tell you what you heard. Here's a microscope picture of that. You can see the nuclei of the hair cells. Stereocilia is what they call some of those hairs here. Now, if we look at your sheet here, we have some equilibrium organs, and we already pointed them out. Remember, the vestibule we set up here was for stationary balance. So it has fluid in it, and it has hair cells. And when you're stationary, your head is just, you know, upright your body's upright, it tells you that you're balanced. It sends nerves to tell you where your head and body are in space. The semicircular canals, when you start moving, the semicircular canals regulate moving balance. Fluid with hair cells and it connected to nerves. So you can see down here, balance, equilibrium means balance. The vestibule is for static, stationary, equilibrium, or balance. The semicircular canals for moving, dynamic equilibrium. If you notice, they're in three dimensions, like I said. There's a lateral one, 
Move that out of the way. It's a lateral one, a vertical one, one for depth. That's one for depth. That's your vertical. So three dimensions. These are interesting if you look at the uh, picture of those. Here, you can see that they operate very similarly. With hair cells with hairs, and they have this gel around them, whether it's semicircular canals or the vestibule. They have gel, some of them have rocks in them, little tiny auto lifts. When you move, the rocks move and they're embedded in this gel that moves. It gives feedback to your body where you are in space. I think this book shows really well. Yeah, so here you go. Gel with little rocks called autolifts in it. You move, moves the fluid and gel in your inner ear, which stimulates these hairs, which stimulates the hair cells, it goes to your brain to tell you where you are. I get really dizzy, so mine are very sensitive. I can't go on any rides or roller coasters. Now, the other two things that help us with balance, and all these work together, we covered in lecture, is the eye, tells you where you are in space, and the proprioceptors. Remember, we had some special sensory organs, and the muscles and tendons. We had the spindle fibers, muscle spindle fibers, and the Golgi tendon organs that tell you where your muscles are in space. So all three of these, internal ear, eye, and proprioceptors and your muscles and tendons work together to keep you balanced. All right, before we move on to some hearing test, I just want to remind you that all of this ear takes place again in the temporal bone. Remember, you learned about this temporal bone and the external auditory meatus. And if we look on the inside now, this external auditory meatus would go all the way through and come out here. You can see a little hole. So the nerve would come out there and go to your brain for hearing and balance. All that inner ear is taking place right in there. The hearing test we don't have on your sheet. We're done with your sheet for now. But I would like you to do this. I can give you some extra bonus points if you do this. Get yourself a tuning fork. They're cheap. And then get something else metal. And you can do a couple hearing tests. Now the two hearing tests are called the Rene test and the Weber test. Now these test whether your hearing is good and also, the, if it's not good, they can test whether it's due to the inner ear, which would be sensory hearing loss, it has to do with the conversion of the sound waves into um, electrical impulses. Or they also detect for conducting hearing loss, which will be due to the bones, okay? So if we look at this picture here, we go over this in lecture. You know, the sound waves come in your ear and they hit that tympanic membrane and they vibrate it. The eardrum then sends those vibrations through the three bones, the three ear ossicles. Then it goes through the oval window and the vibrations go through this fluid of the cochlea. And the vibrations in the fluid, if it's a high-pitched noise, then they'll bend in here. And they'll go across, this organ of cortis about right here, and they'll bend the hairs, and you'll detect it as a high-pitched noise. But if it's a low sound, it's going to go further into the cochlea, and it's going to bend the hairs here, of the organ of cochlea, organ of corti, sorry. All right? And any sound waves that don't bend anything, we don't hear them, they're going to go all the way around and back out the round window into the middle ear, down the eustachian tube. 
So for the pitch, the vibrations, it depends on where they cross the organ of corti and the cochlea. Organ of corti sells all the way along the middle here. For volume, the volume is going to depend on that will bend more hairs the louder the noise. But the location of where it bends determines the pitch. So on this here, so if you have a hearing loss and it's due to um, the organ of corti, it's called sensory hearing loss. But if the hearing loss is due because your sound waves are not being conducted along the bones, that's conductive hearing loss. So in this Rene test, what you want to do is, I'll use this guy here. You'll take this here, and you're going to hit this part here. And it's going to make a noise. And you're going to, once it's making a noise, you're going to hold it, this handle, on their mastoid process. You're going to say, tell me if you hear this, and tell me when it stops. Now, when it stops, you bring these two tubes on here, and you say, can you hear it again now? And they'll say, yeah, they have good hearing. They should hear it longer out here. Because here, it's going along the bone, mastoid process, and it's not being converted if you don't hear it. That's a sensory hearing loss. Once they stop hearing it here, it's still making a noise, but they don't hear it. But you bring it out here, sound waves are going through the air, and they're being conducted through the bone, and you hear it again through the ear ossicles. If you want to determine if both ears have equal hearing, you vibrate this again and hold it up to their forehead and see if they can hear both sides equally. Let's see if we can. Okay, he stopped hearing it. Now here, you should hear it again. Always hold it by the handle. These are fun to do. So here, oh, you can look these up, but or you can pause this video and do these tests. It's called the Rene test. And then we have the Weber test. You can find pictures of it online, but there's the Rene test here and here. And the Weber test is there. The other thing you can get is this reflex hammer. And you can even use that to hit the tuning fork. But get one of these reflex hammers there. Um, very cheap, too. And you can test a couple of those reflexes. Now, remember, on the reflexes, I showed you. The uh, reflexes on the knee, ankle, and I believe that was it. So let's do show you where these reflexes happen here. Okay, now. If we are going to test the knee jerk reflex. We're going to hit this patellar tendon right here, and your leg should kick out. Of course, you have to have your um, knee bent, your leg bent there. So, for example, I'm going to sit on the edge of my chair like this. Just want to kind of let my foot hang out like that. Now, if I hit it right here, the right spot, you can feel it. Feel the patellar tendon below the patella. Okay? Your knee should go out. All right? You're hitting it right here. Now for the Achilles reflex, what you're going to do is you're going to feel it on your own body, and you're going to hit it about right here. That should contract your biceps and your foot should go downwards. 
So if you hit it about right here, you can feel it. Put my rest of my zero on about right there. See, it just moves a little bit. Okay? You hit it in the right spot. Kind of hit it in the right spot. I showed you the Babinski reflex. I'm not going to do that again because my feet are even dirtier than before. You can also do what's called a biceps reflex. And what you do here is hit this one. And your arm should bend, flex. Then if you take this one, the uh, triceps, you hit that tendon, your arm should extend. There's a couple other reflexes you can do. Look some of them up, take videos of them, and then you can uh, send them to me, okay? Let's see if I have any of these here. All right, let's go to the uh, reflex part here. Page 225, okay. You want to get some bonus points, you can send pictures of doing some of these. There's a knee jerk reflex, patellar tendon reflex. Should kick their leg out. This is the best way to do the Achilles ankle jerk reflex. Remember your foot should, when you contract that biceps, I mean the uh, gastrocnemius should pull your heel this way and your foot should go this way. Okay? Feel that way. Feel it there, your foot should go like that. You gotta feel for them now. This is the biceps here. In this case, you actually put your finger on the tendon, biceps tendon, and then hit this part of the, uh, on your finger. I'll show instructions here in a minute. It's the biceps reflex. Here, triceps reflex, you should keep your arm bent first, and then it's going to extend. Okay, so for the biceps, it should flex even more. Triceps, start with a bend, it should extend. And the Babinski reflex, I showed you that on the first uh, spinal video. Drag something sharp like a knife or the tip of this uh, reflex hammer. Not the sharp end of the knife, the handle. And you drag it up on the lateral part towards the big toe and your toes should flex, bend. And that tells you how to do them right here. Send them to me, do them. Knee jerk reflex. Ankle jerk, Achilles reflex, biceps reflex, triceps reflex. Plantar reflex is the Babinski reflex. And if you can find any other ones, there's one called the crossed extensor reflex, it can tickle the abdomen reflex. And then lastly, I do want to show you something else on the eye. I did find another picture of the cow eye. If you remember, we cut this cow eye in half. This would be the front half. That was the back half. Remember on the eye, we concentrated on layers. So on the front half, we can see the outer fibrous layer in white sclera. And then all this black is the vascular layer. This would be the choroid. And as we get up here, close to the pupil, then this circular wheel-like structure is actually the ciliary muscle. This opening would be the pupil, because we're looking at it from the inside. And this circular structure around the pupil, which can dilate or constrict it, that would be the iris. Of course, we took out 
the lens here, which was right behind the pupil, and the lens was embedded in, from behind, posteriorly, with the vitreous humor. Anteriorly, it was surrounded by aqueous fluid, which is kind of dripped out. Now, the posterior half, this thin gray, brownish, beiges, would be the retina, sensory layer. We can still see the vascular layer, the poroid. Where it's all connected would be where the optic nerve would come out. Last thing is I forgot to show you, or I didn't have the information at the time, on the accommodation test, which was on your eye sheet. Now, accommodation is the ability of your lens to adjust for close vision. So basically what happens is if you bring something close, like something to read, then the ciliary muscle is going to contract or rest and adjust that lens, make it bulge or flatten to angle the light waves towards your macula latia of the retina. So you can see what you're reading clearly or whatever is close up. That's called accommodation. But as you get older, those muscles get weaker, your lens gets less elastic. So there's an accommodation test. And how you do this is, borrow this guy again. And you can do this one, I'll send them to me too, for extra credit. Any eye test, ear test, reflexes. Here, you'll bring something in front of your eye like a pen, you can do it yourself, and you're gonna bring it closer and closer into your eye until it's clear. When it's clear, you're gonna measure the distance between your eye and the object, and measure it in centimeters. Now, when you're young, this is the age down here, when you're young, it should be about 10 to 15 centimeters. But as you get older, it gets up to 20, even 30, because your lens is less elastic, sensory ligaments are not as healthy, and your muscles are not as healthy. Okay? That's called presbyopia. Presby always means old. So that's why people often need reading glasses when they get old if they didn't have glasses before. So I'm gonna just try it with this pen. I know it's not gonna work for you, but if I hold this out, it's not gonna work for you on the video. You can try it at home yourself. So when I bring this in, when it gets clear for me, which is about right there, I'm gonna measure that distance. Now I did measure that distance yeah. Can't really hold both of those at the same time, but it was about 25. Okay? 10 inches is about 25. I measured it from the eye to my pen. If we look on this graph, 25 is about right there. It's about right. So it's normal. Now, if you want to know how to do this test, and you want to try it, and you can look it up. But also, I have it right here. First paragraph. So to do some of these tests, get yourself a roller, hopefully a centimeter roller, tuning fork, reflex hammer, and before I went over those two charts there, remember? Snellen eye chart for visual acuity, astigmatism wheel chart, and you can get some colorblind tests on the um, internet. Color blindness is mostly in men, about 10% of men have that red-green color blindness, which is only slight. 
All right. That should do it for now. We got this guy. He says, I'm tired. I think he winked. Do you see him? I think he winked. I better go home.